Hello, my name is Ginger Lee, and welcome to the masterclass on creating interactive light installations with Touch Designer. Just to share a little bit about my background before we jump in, I am an interactive and audiovisual experience designer, and I come from a background of working with creative coding, um, doing a lot of audiovisual work, working with cymatics, and I'm highly interested in real time data, working with different sensors, and exploring the connection between um, the human behavior and biological processes and the world around us, tapping into um, invisible data and information and finding ways to make that uh, unique experiences and uh, multi-sensory experiences enhance the way that we experience the world around us using uh, technology in different ways. And so a lot of my work involves using sensors, interactivity, um, and exploring different ways of making those connections. There are two specific projects I wanted to share with you today um, that are different light installations, and I wanted to share a little bit about how they were created, um, what went into uh, the concept, and the sensors, of course, and interactivity aspect of it, and why I chose to develop it the way that I did. And of course, um, on the back end, how Touch Designer came into play. Um, so this first one that I'm showing you is Conduit. And this one was 2017. And um, the concept for this one is I was actually inspired by um, this idea of a world where people worship sound. And so um, the configuration of it is essentially there's six people standing around in a circle in front of concrete pedestals and uh, in the center of it is different uh, pillars of light that are activated as people touch and interact with the pedestals and each pedestal corresponds to a different high harmonic tone so essentially as they touch the pedestals they're activating different sounds um, that they can hear collectively. Each person has uh, headphones that they can hear these collective sounds that they're making. Um, and as they activate that harmonic tone um, through touching the pedestal, then it lights up um, a single panel within this uh, central sculpture. And the etched symbol on the sculpture represents the, or corresponds to um, the relative frequency that they are activating. So for example, if they're activating the uh, fundamental harmonic tone, um, then it is a uh, single uh, hex hexagonal form. And then if they're activating the second one for every uh, two wave cycles that that one goes through, the fundamental goes through one wave cycle. So it's tied into the mathematics of the sound as well. Um, and exploring um, the psychoacoustics of the sound in, with the way that the audio was created as well and um, basically modulating the sounds to create almost this um, uh, hypnotic state when all the different tones are activated and you can try and separate them. Um, so focusing on the, the interaction aspect of it and uh, the concept and the, the way that, the reason that I chose to create it the way that I did. Um, so, the technical aspect of it, there is, it is based on completing a circle. So there's a wire that goes to the base of each concrete pedestal, which is the beginning of the circuit, right? So it uses an Arduino um, as the main controller aspect of it. Uh, there's a wire that goes to the base of the concrete pedestal and then um, travels up through, the current travels up through the concrete pedestal. And so to complete the circuit, an individual has to touch the pedestal, which then continues the circuit through their body, and then it actually uh, continues on through the headphones, and then um, back to the Arduino to connect the circuit. Um, so with this particular interactive experience, um, I didn't want people to have to focus on touching the pedestal and then also touching something else, because then that would force them to um, be taken away from the experience and focus more on why am I holding this? Why am I holding this? And it would kind of lose that, that magic sense that I wanted to create of activating through just touching this um, pure concrete pedestal. Um, so what I did was I, um, I sewed 
conductive thread around the headphones that they were placing on. So when they placed the headphones on their ears, then that continued the circuit um, without them even realizing that they were, that's what they were doing. So they only had to focus on touching the pedestal and activating one um, aspect of it and then it would complete the circuit when they put on the headphones and continue on throughout. Um, what al that also allowed to happen was that people could experiment with then touching each other's hands and continuing and building a circuit in different ways um, and creating more complex interaction and bridging out from just the initial um, touching the pedestal, but then they could build this um, collective experience through touching each other's hands and building a more complex uh, conductive network throughout that experience. Um, the second one that I wanted to share with you is a more recent experience, uh, actually one of the most recent ones I have worked on, um, which is introspection. And uh, this was a light installation that was most recently at a month-long event called Dazzling Nights in Orlando at Lou, Lou Gardens. I mentioned I'm interested in exploring biological processes. So for this one, um, I was interested in having the installation embody a person's heartbeat. And so um, when they interacted with a heartbeat sensor, then the lights would then in real time pulse with their heartbeat and translate it into um, pulses of light. And so um, this was the second version of the installation, which is um, completely uh, different structure and been redesigned to exactly what I wanted to originally create. So with the structure, um, it's actually very loosely uh, inspired by the idea of essentially a person's rib cage because it, it's all revolving around the heartbeat. And so with this one, you can actually go inside and stand inside of it. And it invites people to basically be surrounded by these pulses of light and uh, kind of feel subliminally like you're inside this rib cage. And so the design of it uh, was actually inspired by that idea of, of a rib cage. Um, with the lights themselves, so when someone interacts with the sensor, then it pulses with their heartbeat. And uh, when someone's not interacting with it, um, when I designed the installation, I wanted to make sure that there was always something happening with the light sculpture. And so when, when the uh, sensor wasn't being engaged with, then it creates these hypnotic uh, tunnel effects with the lights that people can enjoy watching it and uh, become, you know, hypnotized, entranced, pulled into these, this tunnel of light. And then um, when somebody interacts with the sensor, then it switches over and it actually pulses blue so that you know it's responding to somebody's heartbeat. And these blue pulses of light emanate out from the, the center of the uh, light sculpture. So when we get into the touch designer part of the masterclass, we're going to talk about uh, the technical aspects and setting up the interactive experience, how to get data from different uh, sensors and controllers, and how to um, send all that information to control different parameters of the lights and the colors and uh, animations, and how to output that through uh, DMX ArtNet to control the lights. Um, but I wanted to go over several different possibilities with sensors, um, looking at some examples using light installations that I've worked on, but also some examples with other types of experiences, just to look at what's possible with several different examples of different types of control methods and uh, differences that they make in the type of experience that is created with those um, interactive control methods. So one of the controllers that we're going to look at is the Leap Motion controller, which I'm sure that you guys have heard of or seen before, and it can be used in a lot of different ways. Just to show you many different examples of different types of interactive control, um, if you are brand new to the idea of using controllers to um, control lights in different ways to integrate into your work um, and uh, exploring things outside of just using different DMX controllers. Um, then we're gonna talk about just a lot of different uh, methods of using interactive control in creative ways. It essentially uh, can map your hand position in three different axes. So up, down, left, right, back and forth, uh, forward and backwards. And so those values can be mapped to control many different things. So let's say the color of the lights, um, triggering different animations, uh, the brightness, 
all different things. Um, so it's great for variable values, of course, instead of, um, you can also use triggers, which we'll talk about later when we get into the touch designer part of it. Um, but one example of a interactive control device that can be easily, um, the data brought into touch designer and mapped to different projects. A few examples of um, projects that I've used this for in my work. Um, Projection-based projects, but of course can translate directly to working with light as well, um, is using it as a gesture control drawing tool to create uh, different forms that I call ghost flowers. So this was an interactive uh, drawing tool where you can create all different uh, generative art pieces. Um, another example is the Cymatics Theremin, which is at the Orlando Science Center, and this is an interactive um, cymatics visualization tool where you control, just like a theremin, the frequency and amplitude, which then affects the sound vibrations that are visualized in real time and projected on the wall. Um, another example of a different creative uh, interactive device is the Mew Mew gloves, which I've used for different performances and installations. And um, just talking about how different sensors create different types of experiences and which ones are great for some experiences, which are better for um, other ones. Um, so the Mew Mew gloves are similar in a way to the Leap Motion controller, where it's the idea of working with something spatially. So essentially, you know, similar idea where you're using your hands, you're creating gestures, and you're moving to control things spatially. But there are some major, major differences between the Leap Motion and the uh, Mimi gloves. Um, one being that the Mimi gloves has the addition of flex sensors. And so it gives you control to map several different gestures that you can train. Um, so you can do, for example, uh, let's say one finger point, two finger point, you can do um, a knob turning gesture to control different things. Um, so you can create any number of gestures. Um, and of course, in addition to that, then you also have the uh, similar axes with the um, yaw, pitch, roll, rotation, things like that. Um, so talking about experiences and what works well for different types of experiences, um, the Leap Motion Controller, of course, is great for public installations, things where people walk up and they interact with it, and uh, you can wave your hand and interact with it in different ways, and it stays there, and anybody can walk up and intuitively work with it. Um, if you happen to be a uh, performer and you're looking to expand your performance working with lights and uh, add um, some kind of interactivity to your performance, then the Mimi gloves are excellent for that. Um, here's some examples of um, performances where I use the Mimi gloves to control um, both sound and visuals. Um, this was Viscerality, which was actually the first full dome performance using the uh, Mimi gloves for both sound and visual control, uh, using Touch Designer, of course, as the uh, main control of the entire performance. And. Um, another example, which I'm going to show you how to um, integrate with Touch Designer, is using something like Touch OSC to build custom interfaces where you can control any number of things, um, building out the interface to be anything that you want it to be, um, and then sending that data to control things in Touch Designer. So it could be um, an iPad that you're using to um, control interactive uh, elements of the light installation um, or building out um, any number of things, which is touch activated. So of course, if you wanted to have something that people walk up and they interact with, then that's a possibility. When I did a separate performance at Art Tech House, which is uh, vast, I did incorporate um, touch OSC interface in addition to working with the gloves because um, in giving some tips and tricks on um, thinking about what sensors to work with and what sensors work best. Um, I learned from doing Viscerality that one of the things that I really wanted was some additional control over being able to calibrate some things uh, before the show and have some very specific um, parameters that I had easy access to to be able to adjust that were separate from what I wanted to control with the gloves. So there are some cases where it might make sense to combine different sensors for different needs and thinking about uh, what works best for different experiences. So 
Sometimes when you choose the control method, it might be based on the experience and wanting to work with a specific technology um, that you're interested in. And sometimes it might be choosing that technology based on a specific need that you have. So if you have a need of being able to control something in a very specific way, then you might need to even uh, maybe end up creating your own type of controller, which is, of course, always possible and fun to do as well. Um, another example of a controller that, um, again, I'm very interested in uh, biological processes and tapping into things like uh, using our brain waves to control different things and being able to visualize the process, um, what's happening in our, our minds and brain computer interfaces. So um, this is an installation that I did, um, Cymorph, that was at Snap Gallery in Orlando, and it was up for two months. Um, so some considerations to think about when working with different sensors is asking questions like, how long is the installation going to be up? What do I want the interaction to be like? Are people going to be, um, is it intuitive? So can people walk up and understand how to interact with it right away? Or is there a learning curve? And if there is a learning curve, is that enjoyable to the experience? And is that really um, the experience that you want to create? So with this, um, there were a lot of considerations that went into it. I wanted to create something that um, was very intuitive and people could walk up and understand how to put on the EEG headset and understand how it worked. And I also wanted it to be able to um, work for anybody that put it on without having to um, spend a lot of time essentially calibrating it for every single person. And so there was a lot of thought that went into being able to create that experience that I just described. Um, and so with uh, EEG headsets, obviously, and brain computer interfacing, there are a lot of different options and a lot of um, more clinical oriented uh, EEG um, uh, scalp that you've probably seen um, that do have higher resolution and give you a lot more data. But something like that for a installation where you're going to have lots of people um, trading off and working with uh, different um, with the sensor in different ways um, can be a bit cumbersome. So sometimes it's a trade-off trying to figure out um, what type of sensor you want to use that gives you the amount of data that you want, but is also it fits with all of the other criteria that you have to create um, the optimized experience. And this is uh, last year before things got shut down, I was working on a project that I was going to present um, using the EEG headset to um, control the lights in different ways. And so this is a quick shot from that. And of course, sound is a huge factor in being able to control lights. So when we jump into Touch Designer, I'm going to show you how to um, get sound from the environment, um, from microphone, from other things, and use sound to drive lights for live performance. If you are a um, show production, or if you're doing your own performance, or if you want to use light creatively in a public installation, and not just sensors, but also um, you can get other kinds of input data real time um, from many different things as interesting uh, triggers to control lights. So um, this example was using Twitch chat as a text to speech generator. This was something I created during the uh, interactive immersive HQ um, competition that won first place for that. And uh, so in this example, I'm grabbing the um, text from the audience and then translating that to speech and then using that to then um, mix into audio in Ableton. And so using the same idea, just to spark ideas for um, things that you might want to do for your own light installation projects is um, use input from different APIs and um, integrate that into controlling lights in various ways and find interesting way of exploring the data. Connecting that data to different parameters of the light using Touch Designer um, and building out this whole 
um, amazing uh, light display that conveys the data from whatever data set you're working with or whatnot. So what is the best controller to work with? It really comes down to what is the experience that you're trying to create. Um, so we're going to take a look at the technical side of how to set it up. But from the experience side, um, I feel it's always important to not let the technology get in, way, in the way of the experience and not let the technology become necessarily the experience. So, you know, if somebody walking up to a leap motion controller and interacting with it, if the controller becomes the focal point of what's interesting about the experience and not necessarily the thing that they're controlling, then maybe that is not necessarily the best way to present your work. Um, but it's something for you to decide and you to think about. And uh, maybe that fun aspect might be something that you enjoy is that some is that people are so, um, you know, in interested in the uh, technology that you're using, which is great, too. So um, so what controller to use definitely comes down to thinking about what is important to you? What do you want to put out there in the world for other people to experience? And that's all that really matters is, is making that aspect happen. All right, so now we're going to hop over into Touch Designer and we're going to look at some examples of setting up interactive light installations. Um, there's three different examples that we're going to go over. And for these, I'm assuming that you know a little bit about Touch Designer to begin with. Um, but if you are new to Touch Designer, then we're going to kind of walk through step by step. So if you are new, then you should hopefully be able to still follow along and still get a lot out of this example. Uh, but I do recommend if you're brand new to, exam to Touch Designer, first off, welcome. Uh, second of all, um, I highly recommend watching some beginner tutorials and um, checking out some things along with this just to make sure that everything makes sense if you have any questions. But I am going to go step by step. So hopefully in following along, then all of this should make a lot of sense, um, even if you are fairly new to Touch Designer. Um, so the examples that we're going to go over today is starting with essentially... Um, the basic setup that you need for controlling lights in Touch Designer. And so we're going to walk through all of the essentials that you need for uh, communicating with light fixtures, setting up the uh, DMX, configuring your universes, things like that. And the second example that we're going to be looking at is um, the exact same idea, but configuring it very differently so that you start to organize your um, network in a different way so that it makes sense if you're working with a team um, and you can um, start to organize and compartmentalize different aspects of the project. And finally, um, we're going to jump into, of course, the uh, fun side of interactive control, working with different sensors, uh, getting data input into Touch Designer, so then you can start taking that data and mapping that to control lights in fun interesting different ways for installations, uh, live performance, uh, different projects that you'll be working on. Um, and this one here is actually controlling the lights behind me. So when we get to that part, then you'll get to see a live example of what the uh, control is doing to lights behind me. So let's jump into the first example here. Um, before we dive into this container, um, if you're new to the idea of basically setting up custom parameters in Touch Designer, um, what we're looking at here is a base that contains, I'll show you really quick, um, different operators inside of it. So if we go up to the top level here, um, I have, if you right click and customize component, um, I've set up custom uh, parameters that I have assigned here and then that way I can reference those parameters when we are deeper inside of the network and uh, be able to um, hand enter in basically hand code the information that I'm going to be needing this is one way of organizing your information and passing information around network we'll talk about a few others um, but we're going to be referencing this a lot so I just want to point that out before we jump into the, the uh, container um, that this is what we're going to be working with. Or, I'm sorry, the base. I should specify base, not container, because they are two different things. All right, so let's go ahead and jump aside our base here. And uh, just an overview, as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at organizing our project a completely different way 
in the next example. So in this one, everything is all on the same level. Um, in Touch Designer, one of the great things about it is that you can organize your network pretty much anything that, any way that you want that makes sense um, for that project. So with this first example, in taking our first look at the essentials of setting up a lighting project, everything is on the same level so that we can see an overview of everything that we're working with. And I'm going to walk you through all of the operators without um, maybe some of the confusion of having too many things embedded and jumping in and out of different layers. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into our first operator here, which is our line SOP. And uh, just a quick note, if you double click, this is how you access all of your operators in Touch Designer. So the different colors are the different families. Okay. Um, so for our line SOP, um, essentially when we set up this first operator here, this is going to represent what's going to be our LED strip. So when we set up our line SOP here, what we want to do is essentially use this to emulate the LED strips that we're going to be programming. So with our line SOP, we have a parameter number of points, and you can see it's referencing our parent par num LEDs. So that's, as I mentioned here, something that I, a uh, custom parameter that I created so that I can change this number and it will change this as I update that information. So I can reuse this for different projects as I um, change the LED strips that I'm working with. So we're going to have that parameter equal to the number of LEDs that we're using for each strip. Our copy SOP is going to uh, essentially copy that LED strip the number of times that we have for um, each strip. So if we have 10 strips, then we're going to uh, reference it as in this case, I have uh, 12 strips and also 12 universes. So it's referencing that and it's going to make duplicates to match the number of strips that I need in my setup. Okay. And it's always good to end our network with a no. That's just really good practice so that in, you'll see that a lot in the network is just ending everything with a no. Um, it's just really clean. And in case I need to add anything in between, it's a good idea to just have that null on the end. Um, finally, and I added a note, by the way, um, if you're going through this project, I added a note on what each section is doing, just a little quick cheat sheet. Um, so in this section, what we're doing is we're using a SOP2 to get the positional data from our LED strips. And so we have multiple LED strips that we've set up here, and we are using our SOP2 to get the X, Y, and Z positional data of every single uh, point in those strips. Now, when I mention points, I've actually turned on, if we zoom way in, you can see all these tiny numbers here. And the way that you get those to show up, because those are important numbers, um, if you right click, you can go to display options and turning this number on will show you the individual points on each of those um, line stops that we created. So actually, if I go back here, let's go ahead and just do it to this one too. Display options, and you can see it turns it on there. Um, and the reason that we want to do that is because that shows us the index of the points as it's going through um, each of the points on the line stop, which is going to correspond to our channel data. So we need to use this to make sure that um, this matches the order that we want to be able to send out the data to our LEDs. Because if that order is different, then you might have, let's say you're trying to send a pattern equally across all the lights, then it might actually be flipped if the order is not correct and corresponding to how they're wired up in your, in your physical project. Okay. So then we have our positional data. Um, the next thing that we want to do is our uh, top two is referencing our image information that we're going to be using the um, TX, TY, TZ, so our positional data from the points, essentially those are going to be used to sample this image um, based on this information here. So wherever those points are, those are that's going to be our sample data that's going to sample the incoming image um, and that's what our top two is doing. So for this part here, Essentially, um, this trio here is controlling our speed for our ramp. 
Um, we're using a very simple ramp here as our, our example, but this can be anything. It can be a movie file. Um, it can be a um, any image that comes in. So basically this doesn't have to be a ramp. It can be any image and we'll get to several examples on that in just a bit, but where you're gonna use a ramp for this example. So for the ramp, um, we have the speed moving and you can see that our channel data is moving here. And so when we drag and drop this, right, as we've already done, then it's using, as mentioned, the um, positional data from our, um, uh, our points in our SOPs that we created to sample this, in, this uh, ramp that's coming in here. Okay. Once we do that, continue on down here, and then we'll, we'll go up here for a second to show you what that is. Um, continuing on getting the colors that we're gonna be sending to the LEDs. Um, what that does is it sends it to, um, we need to, sorry, we need to shuffle the information. So by using our, our shuffle chop, um, what that's going to do, if we set it to sequence all samples, is it takes this information here so let's say I turn this off for a second. So it's taking our RGB information and it's ordering it so that it goes the first index of R, first index of G, first index of B. So basically it's going to then go back to the beginning and order it RGB, 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 RGB continuously until we get to the end of all of our samples, which matches the format that we need for sending out our DMX. Because when you're sending to LEDs, um, if you haven't worked with LEDs before, um, when you're sending it to a series of LEDs in a strip, then the first LED is gonna grab the first three uh, points of information, which is gonna be our RGB. And then when it goes to the next one, the next LED is gonna grab the second RGB, those three. And then when it goes to the third, it's gonna grab the next RGB. So essentially it's sending um, a continuous uh, signal of information and then each LED is going to grab what it needs and then pass it on in serial to the next LED in the, in the series. Um, so that's why we really need to make sure that we format our information in a very specific way before we send it out to our LED strip. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and switch that back to sequence all samples. Okay, so that's going to look like that. Um, the next thing that we're going to do here is um, if you look at the values for this information here. So this is coming from my image and uh, when it translated it, it um, grabbed the information basically zero to one, as you can see here. And because the LEDs are RGB, it's mapped to zero to 255, essentially um, 256 values of color, but the range is zero to 255. So what we need to do is use the math top to adjust that range from our original range, which is zero to run one. And then we're going to adjust that range zero to 255 so that it actually sends out the range that we need to match to our colors for our LEDs. Um, and then I'm simply renaming it okay, to universe because this information, once we break it up, um, is then going to, um, after we break it up, become our individual universes that we are sending out to the individual LEDs. Okay, so we're just renaming it there so that we send it to our second shuffle. And what we're doing here is, so this was also our shuffle. It's not that one. This is shuffle. Here we are sequencing all of those channels into one continuous um, channel here. And then the second shuffle, what we're doing is we are taking all of that information and breaking it out so that we have one universe per LED strip. Okay. And you can see I referenced here um, our parent, uh, the number of LEDs, right, which we had in the beginning for the um, original strip, and then multiplying it times three because each LED strip um, has the RGB. So we need to multiply it times three because it's not gonna have just the number of LED uh, per strip in information. It has three times that amount of information because each single LED is taking three values for itself. Okay, so that's why we're multiplying it by three. Okay, so if we set split end samples, then it's going to give us this format that we have here, which is perfect. That's exactly what we need to be able to properly send that information out to our um, lights once we get to the DMX part in just a second. 
Okay, so we have that. Um, this part here, uh, we're not going to get too deep into that, but uh, essentially what this is, is um, a really nice way of taking this information here and um, I'll zoom in just so you can see what we're doing. Um, once we name it, this is going to then automatically um, fill in our DMX uh, table here, our route routing table based on the, um, as we change the settings and it creates more universes and we adjust the number of lights, et cetera, um, so that we don't have to hand enter this. So just to show you an example of what I mean. Um, so here's our DMX out. If I create a, brand new DMX out, which is going to be sending out the data to our lights. So DMX is our alphabet DMX out, All right? So um, once we have the DMX out and we click on this, it comes with this table here. So um, by default, let's go ahead and just, I'll drag this over here so you can see what happens. Um, so this is actually a great starting point, so I can walk you through this. Um, so when I drag it, you can see that automatically this looks completely different than all this nice formatting that we did over here. So this is not going to do us very much good because um, this is exactly what we want. And this is not what we want. And it's a really easy fix, but we need, do need to fix it. Um, so when we have this, the first thing that I want to do is change to packet per channel because okay, we've gone through all that formatting but every single universe is a single channel so I do want to set it to packet per channel so that every single channel is sending out per universe um, so change that and now we're looking pretty good um, but you can see that this doesn't automatically fill in so that's why we have all of this down here so that it automatically fills in for us um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because we can of course um, since this is a table and we've worked with tables before, if you've used Touch Designer, you've probably worked with tables. Um, so if you change exact dimensions and turn it on, then it's going to give you these rows, rows and columns down here. And um, so we did do it automatically here, but you can see the formatting that we need is essentially the channel is going to be the name of the channel that we created. And then we're telling it where we want to go um, in terms of assigning the universes. So. Um, in this particular example, for the channel, I would put universe zero. Right? I'm not gonna type all this out, but I would type universe zero. Um, in this situation, we do net as zero, so I'm not zero. And then the universe I would assign to um, universe zero or whatever universe you happen to wanna send out to. Maybe you don't wanna send it to universe zero. So in that case, it's really nice to be able to go in and um, can enter all that information so that you have a lot more custom control over how you do that. Um, while we are here, there's a lot of things because this is basically the essential part of being able to communicate with the lights, right? So we're going to spend a bit of time talking about the different uh, properties of the DMX out. Um, so once we configure this information here, which we have already set up in the other one, um, what we want to do is uh, for this example, um, for the interface, there's some of them that come automatically, um, like if you're working with the um, NTEC USB Pro, uh, which we're not going to be using today, um, but that's automatically there. Um, we're going to be focusing on ArtNet just because that's what I'm using for the ones behind me. And so um, when we get to that, it's uh, related. So we're going to be focusing on ArtNet today. Um, but if you do use any of like the NTEC um, or any of these others, then that is an option there. Uh, but we're going to just use ArtNet as the example today. Um, for the, so we have our packet per sample. Um, DMX routing table is, of course, referencing this one here. You can change that as we've done in the other one. So you can create your own routing table and just replace that one. Um, for the network is the important one. Um, so the network address, um, you want to basically have the network address of your uh, ArtNet controller. So for this one to show you, um, so you have your net address and then local address. So this is going to be uh, communicating in this case over Ethernet with the uh, controller. And once that is um, the proper IP address, then it's going to send this data over Ethernet to the uh, controller 
and then the controller is then going to um, send out the information per universe to the lights as you've assigned it to do. Okay, um, so that's essentially the setup for how to create a the very core essentials of being able to communicate with your lights, right? So um, step one, we've essentially um, set up a um, SOP-based example of what our lights look like or what our light strips look like. And we assigned the number of LEDs um, for that. If you have a totally different configuration, um, for example, like I'm gonna show you at the end, if you have like a triangle instead of it being just like a, a straight LED strip, then we'll look at how to set that up. But essentially this is going to be recreating what your LED strips look like uh, physically and the number of LEDs that you're working with. Um, and then you can duplicate them. And then um, if you do have, for example, um, an LED wall, you can use a grid. Um, so you could do something like this and uh, work with a grid stop instead of doing the line. Um, let's see, so you could set the rows, let's do view, not view, sorry, display options, all right, and this, okay, so you can see that basically it has all of the points um, similar to what we just did, and then you could break it up differently. Um, sometimes it's easier to work with the individual strips than it is to set it up this way. Totally up to you, but uh, just letting you know, it is an option if you have an LED wall and you wanted to um, break it up that way, you could. And so finally, uh, let's take a look at basically creating a preview of what our LED colors are going to look like after we create that mapping of uh, the colors to the pixel values of the LEDs. Okay, um, so the next part, the uh, visualization that I mentioned, is essentially we're going to use the position data that we got from the LEDs that we set up here. So we're gonna take our position data and we're going to take our RGB data and we're going to combine those. Okay, so all that we're doing is using a merge to just combine those values together. And then this is our null that I mentioned. So always good to finish with a null just in case you need to add anything else here. It's just really good practice. And what we're doing from there is we're using our geo. Um, so this is just a sphere, a really, really small sphere that's going to represent a single pixel which is, let's see if you can see it here. So this is our sphere. So the sphere is representing a single LED pixel in the light. Um, and our geo, what we've done is if you go to the instant, instancing page on our geo and turn instancing on, it's gonna be off by default, but you can turn instancing on. And then um, we're going to drag our instancing operator to our default instance op. And what that does is then give us access to the channels that we're going to be using to uh, create the instance, which is these here, and also tell it what color those instances should be. So on the first page, we're going to TX, TY, TZ is our position data for those spheres that we're instancing. And on the second page, we are going to scroll down, scroll down, not scroll out, uh, scroll down here and uh, put RGB for our color data. We do not need A, by the way, because we're working with um, RGB in this situation here. Um, so we do not need our alpha. And actually I should mention um, when you do sample the image here, it automatically does uh, pull the alpha. So you can just delete the A from the alpha section here. So for example, by default, when you create it, it's going to have the alpha and you can just uh, delete that and then it's going to remove that channel information from that operator. Okay. So once we do the instancing, then it creates our instances based on the information that we gave it. And we now have a visualization of the sampled information in what it will look like for our um, LED strips that we've created. So this is a really nice preview of what it's going to look like if we actually set up our LED strips exactly as they are here. 
um, just to show you that it is live, of course. Um, so if we change our ramp, let's say to something else, um, you can see that as I'm doing that, that's, that it is adjusting this information here. Let's do there's some weird colors. Um, so if we change those colors here, then you can see that it does update our preview. And so we can um, get a good idea of what the physical installation is going to look like if this is um, accurate to how we're going to set it up in the physical installation. All right. So that is the core setup for being able to um, create a um, image that we're going to be sampling the colors, setting up the uh, physical example with the SOPs of what the LED strips are going to look like and then creating the previs. So now we're going to start jumping into getting a little bit more organized with the project, um, working in different ways with that idea. Um, and then of course we're going to jump into the interactive part and working with controllers and sensors and doing a lot of other fun stuff. So if we jump down to the second example, um, this is the exact same uh, project that we just walked through. So the exact same as this here. Everything that is inside of this here is also the same as here, but broken up in a very different way. Um, so this is how I like to work. This is um, more uh, my project style here. Um, and the, w the reason I lay things out this way is because I like to compartmentalize things um, based on very specific different areas of the project that I might be working on. And so as we walked through the other one, as you noticed, there were different parts that we were working on in terms of setting up the physical layout of what the LED strips look like, and then uh, setting up what the image looks like that we're going to be sampling. Um, that's going to be the final uh, colors for the LED, and then also setting up the uh, visualization for it and creating the, the DMX mapping output. So um, those were very specific different areas of the project. And so um, compartmentalizing those different areas so that those can be built out independently, um, but still connected, uh, makes a lot of sense in terms of just organizing your project in a very nice, clear, defined way. Um, it also works really nicely working this way because um, if you happen to be working with a team, um, then different people can work on different areas of the project um, independently and then uh, be able to focus on that without it being part of one big connected network that's all, in the, all on the same level. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in and take a look at um, how this one is set up as opposed to the other one. Um, and then we'll get to the, the controllers and interactive part. All right, so for the LED strips, um, if you dive in here, so we've set up, this is all of our LED mapping, uh, setting up the SOP, and then we get our SOP2 with our LED, LED positions, and then outputting that uh, to, uh, we have our, sorry, to our top two, and then we have our specific graphics, which in our next examples, um, there's a lot of different graphics that we can switch between. So right now we just have that one example that matches the setup of our other um, example. And then our LED mapping. So all of this is just for our LED um, output. And the DMX that we set up before, organizing our channel so that it's the proper format to send out to our lighting fixtures. And then all of that is then going into our previs here. Okay, and that is our uh, instancing that we were just looking at a minute ago. Okay. Right. So again, exact same project, but just organizing it in, to me, I feel, a much clearer way so that it's um, compartmentalized and it makes sense so that you can build out different parts. So let's take a look at that example of building out different parts. Um, so for this next one, getting into talking about the control parts of it, now that we've talked about the essentials that go into building the project, now we can start to talk about how to um, essentially work with controllers, sensors, different uh, interactive methods that that then becomes a control for the colors, um, for the animations, for different aspects of the lighting programming. 
Um, so with this one, exact same project that we just looked at a second ago, but we now have the addition of control. So um, just to pause for a second here, so you can see literally just the different parts that go into the project. So we have the layout, the graphic, um, the LED mapping and the control. So these are the core completely different areas that you can build out more in depth um, within each of these areas. Um, so if we, if we dive into the control part, um, so here's where we're going to start uh, focusing on the technical aspect of working with different um, sensor, dif different controllers and bringing that data in in real time to be able to control different interesting behaviors with the uh, lights, changing colors and um, changing animation and pretty much anything that you want to control with the lights that you can um, dream of. Um, so if we go to the leap motion, let's go ahead and dive in. Um, and with this one, um, you'll see, so I kind of broke this out into different containers for the different examples that we're going to be going over today. Um, and so for these different examples, um, normally for a project, I of course would not be using all of these control methods within the same project. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that all of these are um, for the examples that I'm showing you today. So for a project, um, you might not necessarily want to have or have use for having a leap motion and a OSC input and a MIDI controller and audio input and uh, countless other things. So um, just to clarify for this example, um, all of these are in here for examples and not necessarily as part of um, all one project that you would want to have all of these controllers working together. But maybe you do, maybe it'd be fun, um, but I'll leave that up to you. Um, so for the leap motion, um, if we zoom in here, um, Touch Designer makes it really uh, intuitive and easy to get the incoming data from the leap motion, which makes it really nice. Um, so I'm gonna actually just uh, kind of start from scratch over on the side here. Um, so if you double click and then you go to the channel operators and you can go to the leap motion operator and um, you do need to install the latest SDK, which is really easy to do. Um, you just go to the web website. And um, so with this, um, actually, let's see. Um, the reason that, that mine isn't coming up right now, actually, I should just jump over here. So with this one, um, I have it paused because I have multiple uh, USB devices plugged in at the same time. So this one is paused because um, actually uh, ran out of between mm, eight different USB devices. Um, I had to alternate between different things. So this gave me a really great opportunity to show you guys something that's really cool to touch designer. And that is uh, that if I have touch designer working on a separate computer and I wanted to connect that computer uh, and the data from that version of Touch Designer to this other computer that I'm working on, um, then what I can do is use a uh, touch out on that version of Touch Designer and a touch in on the version of Touch Designer that I want to receive the data in. And that will give me the opportunity to bring in the data from that other computer. So just to give you an example of what I'm talking about. so. Um, Without that, um, I have this uh, paused, which is the lock button there. Um, when I had it plugged into my computer directly, then I was getting all this information um, and it was, uh, I could select the channels that I wanted to using the select here. And then um, basically focus on, on the information that I want from that. But um, there are lots of opportunities where uh, maybe you are working with multiple computers and you do need to connect the data in different ways, then you can use the touch in. So um, leap motion here is actually right now connected to a totally different computer and I can then interact with it. And the touch out on that computer is sending the information to this touch in. Um, the only way thing that you need to do to get that to work is to set the address to the um, computer that you are communicating with and make sure that you are connected on the same port and then voila. 
the information is sending over the network directly to this computer. So it does work out really nice. And that gave me an opportunity to show that little trick to you guys. And it doesn't need to be a separate computer. You can actually uh, send information uh, between different instances of Touch Designer on the same computer. Uh, so there's lots of different ways that you can use that to uh, send information between uh, Touch Designer in different ways. Okay. So to show you an example of using that, let me go ahead and open our uh, visualizer here. Okay, so this is the visualizer that's controlling the lights behind me. And um, so for the uh, leap motion, um, what I'm doing is, uh, let's take a step back for a second here, um, is inside the controller, we have all of these different possible outputs, right? So I have my leap motion here and I've isolated the data that I want to get from the leap motion, right? So in this case, um, for a simple example, I'm just using the X, Y, and Z um, position data. Okay, so the X, Y, and Z data. Um, and then in my uh, graphic top, or sorry, graphic um, base, I am pulling in all that different information. Um, so in this case, I have my uh, leap controller information coming in. And uh, I use a math to essentially adjust the values to be the range that I need to control the parameter that I want. And um, in this case, I'm using it to control, let's see, if we jump inside the ramp, um, I have different um, ramp visuals that I can switch between. And so with the leap motion controller, and see that I am controlling, let's see, running out of real estate here. Let's scale this down. I have that value map to control the uh, phase of it and also controlling the period, which completely changes the effect, right? So, um, right now, so this is the preview, and if I switch it, um, so the leap motion controller is controlling the parameters of this visualization. Okay. So as I move my hand, um, the left and right is controlling the period, and the up and down is controlling the phase of it. Okay. And I have these different ramps. Okay, so I set up basically different um, visualizations with the ramp, um, which is going to a switch. And for this example, just to show you different inputs, I have those um, controlled by right now my keyboard input. You could also set up um, different, uh, if you have different visualizations that you want to switch between, you could also use a MIDI controller, um, anything that has basically different um, number type input. So for this, the keyboard works really well because then you have, um, you know, zero through nine that you can just assign to different things. If you have a MIDI controller, then you can set up um, different visualizations that are triggered by different um, button presses or different input from the MIDI controller. So we'll take a look at also using the MIDI controller for that type of input. Um, so just to show you how I have it set up here, um, Sorry if anyone's photo sensitive. Um, so behind me, um, I have this controlling the different variables and then that output is being sent directly to the lights. So that pre-visualization that I mentioned, um, all of that is live. And as I change things, the pre-visualization is showing me exactly what's being sent out to the lights in real time. I could do this all day long. All right, so going on to the next example um, of input, let's go back to, we're gonna look at the, the graphics more in depth in just a second. Um, so looking at different control, uh, as I mentioned, um, I also am working with a keyboard input. Um, so in Touch Designer, you can use a, a keyboard operator 
which allows you to select, as I've entered here, the keys that you want to get input from. So as I press the keys, you can see that they're they're changing from zero to one. Um, so talking about different types of um, talking about different types of input and figure out what controllers you want to work with. Um, this is a really great example of um, discussing the different types of input. So with this, um, you can see how it's changing from zero to one. So that's obviously acting as a trigger. So anything that is either off or on is essentially a trigger, right? So it's either turning something on or off, zero or one. It's on or off. It's not. It's nothing in between. There's no a variable value between zero or one. So it's acting as, as a trigger value. Um, so controllers like the keyboard um, or MIDI controller that you just press a button and it's on or off um, work great for things where you do need to have control be uh, switching different things. So um, it's an on and off type control. Um, if you're trying to um, change the color of something, for example, just talking about different ways of setting it up, um, the on and off type control, um, or something like this with a keyboard where you have different numbers. So we have zero through nine. Um, this would work great for if you have set up nine colors that you want to switch between. So you've already assigned those, uh, nine colors and you want to switch between them. But if you wanted to smoothly, say, um, translate between the color spectrum and change the uh, the hue of something very smoothly, as opposed to it's either one of these nine values I pre-selected. But if you want to change smoothly between the hue, then having a trigger is not going to allow you to do that very nicely. Um, so that's why it's really good to think about what kind of things you want to be able to do with your installation um, or with your interactive light experience, um, anything that you're controlling. Uh, think about the kind of things that you want to be able to do and think if you need a trigger type uh, control or if you need something that has a variable value um, that can actually control something within the range of um, zero to one or remapping that to whatever value that you want uh, so it gives you more flexibility. Um, so that's, for example, because we were just working with Elite Motion, um, so that var variable value that we talked about, um, the Elite Motion is an example of that. And so if we have our movement here, uh, we can, of course, change the value range to be anything that we want it to be, but this is not acting as a trigger. It's acting as um, a smooth translation within this number space that we're working with. And so if I'm controlling in this situation the hue of the lights, then this can smoothly navigate across that color spectrum um, by moving my hand up and down or left and right, however I uh, program it to do so. So it's a totally different type of control. Um, with the leap motion, um, you can also, I don't have it set up in this example, but you can also um, do different gestures like a, a pinch, for example. Um, so in that case, you could use that as a trigger kind of activation um, because that would be on or off. You're either pinching or you're not pinching. You're either doing the gesture or not doing the gesture. Um, and then once you do that pinch, then maybe that means that, okay, when I'm pinching and then I do this motion, then I want to control this specifically. Um, and then when I'm not pinching, then that means that I'm controlling this other parameter instead of doing that. So you can use that to kind of um, activate very specific parameters. And then within that, you're controlling those values. Um, so then the next example that we're going to look at, oops, sorry. Did not want to add that. Um, the next example that we're going to look at is working with um, OSC messages. And um, I use OSC all the time um, because basically what it is uh, is a communication protocol that allows you to send configured messages, a uh, very specific format, between different softwares, between uh, controllers, communicating wirelessly. Um, there's a lot of different times when you might end up using OSC to send messages back and forth and send messages into Touch Designer. So definitely something that I use all the time. And I think it's super important to be covered in any sort of uh, interactive 
experience workshop. Um, so looking at the example for OSC, um, it's actually really, really easy to set up if you've never worked with it. Um, so the way that it works is essentially um, you have something sending the message and something receiving the message, and they simply need to be on the same net, same network and agree on the same port that they're communicating on, right? So, um, and few notes on that. If you have something using the same port, of course, it's going to then uh, tie up that port and it's going to block it. So you just need to make sure that whatever port they're communicating on, uh, don't reuse that port for anything else because it will block the communication. Um, another important note before we get to the example, um, super important, is um, if you're using Touch Designer for sending OSC messages, uh, just make sure that your computer, uh, your firewall isn't blocking those messages because um, if you start to use it and, and you can't figure out why it's not working and it should absolutely work, um, that can be one of the number one things that people forget to check is just whatever software you're using, always make sure that um, all of the software involved in communicating. So if you have Ableton sending a touch designer or um, another machine sending a touch designer, just make sure that there's no firewalls anywhere in that setup that are blocking the communication of sending that data to touch designer. Um, so with that being said, um, it's actually really easy to set up in touch designer working with um, OSC messages. Um, in this particular case, um, as our first example, I am not even leaving Touch Designer. Essentially, I'm sending the LFO information directly into our OSC out. And we are, as you can see, network address is localhost. That means that it's staying on this machine. I'm not even going out on the network. I'm simply on the same machine. Um, so OSC out is sending that channel data directly to the OSC in. All right, so the OSC in, as you can see, network port 9000, 9, network port 9000, they're on the same network, same port, so they are communicating wonderfully and sending from this one, OSC out to OSC in. So these are connected. Um, as mentioned before, of course, uh, since we're on the same uh, network, it'd be really easy to use a touch out for this also if you wanted to, um, but since we're using OSC information, I want to specifically show you working with OSC because you're going to be using OSC, I'm sure, for different projects. Um, with Ableton sending to Touch Designer or with Touch OSC sending to Touch Designer or a lot of different software. So um, OSC comes up in lots of different interactive projects. Um, the other example down here um, is actually using a software called Touch OSC that I wanted to show you guys, um, which is great for if you want to create just uh, really nice custom interfaces to control anything within Touch Designer or control um, your lighting installations. Let's say that you want to calibrate stuff, being able to just quickly, um, you know, on your uh, iPad or on your uh, phone or whatever it happens to be. Um, and then you can communicate directly with Touch Designer using whatever interface you set up, right? So right, my phone is a little bit better, uh, not so much. Um, anyway, so my phone here, uh, this is a really super quick uh, example that I set up in Touch OSC, which has its own editor where you can build out all these different um, sliders, all these different push buttons, anything that you want, this uh, two axis slider here, right? Um, so you can essentially build out any interface that you want. And then um, what that does is then it sends OSC messages based on however you name them and configure them. Um, and then essentially set up the network and the port that we talked about. And now once I do this, uh, you can see it's sending that information directly to Touch Designer. So um, I've used this kind of setup, totally different uh, interface that I, I made, but I've used this exact setup for um, uh, live performances, calibrating things for the show when I do stuff wirelessly with the, the Mimu gloves. And it works out great because that gives me so much flexibility over being able to control things. So for an inter interactive light installation, um, this is a really small example, but imagine um, building out 
uh, different touch screens that you can control stuff, like I mentioned with an iPad, other things where um, people are controlling the lights in different ways, um, if that's the kind of experience that you are interested in doing. Or, um, as mentioned, just even behind the scenes for you personally, if you're developing the light installation and want to be able to calibrate things, then you can easily set it up that way. Um, so looking at the information that's sending us, um, you'll notice actually at the very top, it's also sending us um, the accelerometer data. Um, so many years ago, I even used this uh, with the accelerometer data um, for an installation where people were controlling the, uh, the color of the lights and projections through, um, essentially, they use this as a device where as they were dancing, um, different things were reacting to the music in real time, and it was a dance visualizer, and as they moved um, the phone that was the controller, um, then it was also changing the lights and controlling different things based on their, their dance movements and other things that they were doing with the, uh, the phone as a controller. Um, and so, also we have our buttons, of course, that come up that way. And so what we can do is then, since you customize this interface in any way that you want, then you can um, process the information if you need to scale it using the math, um, scale the, um, the values that you're working with, pull out specific stuff that you want. Um, and let's see. Let's go ahead and go back up. So that's the OSC. Um, as I mentioned, and you saw, super easy to work with. Um, comes up all the time in different projects, um, especially working with Ableton and um, uh, different integration with Touch Designer. It makes it really, really nice. Um, MIDI example, um, also super easy to set up and work with in Touch Designer and connect this data to um, other things that you're controlling within the project. Um, so. Again, I have this one uh, locked, but just to show you the kind of information that comes in from a MIDI controller. Um, going back to what I was saying before about having uh, some things in controllers that are triggers, some things that are variable. As you can see here, I have this thing called aftertouch. Um, so this information was coming from a, uh, the Arturia Beatstep controller which has pads where when you push them, um, if you push and then hold down and then apply force, then while you're pressing it, it actually fluctuates based on the force that you're applying. So that ends up being really cool because that adds a, another dimension of control that can be used to, um, when you push the button to activate something, then like let's say that I have the lights, I wanna fluctuate the brightness of the lights, then I could push to turn the lights on uh, to whatever um, amount I'm pressing it. And then as I uh, apply different force, then it fluctuates the brightness of the lights. Um, so that ends up being something that could be used in a lot of different ways to control things that, um, that you do want to have that variable fluctuating value that you can change really easily based on pressing it. Um, and then, of course, the, the pads, the on and off, becomes the trigger value. And um, I do recommend... Aftertouch is really nice. Um, if you're getting a MIDI controller, if you don't already have one um, or you're looking to get a new one, um, I do recommend getting one that has something like Aftertouch and or um, uh, the uh, velocity sensitive. Um, so velocity is essentially when you hit it, it detects how hard you're hitting it. It is different from Aftertouch because Aftertouch is you hit it and then you hold your finger down and it fluctuates, whereas velocity is initial press of like how hard you, um, it's like a, like a piano key, right? So you press the piano key and then it's that initial, how hard you, um, press it. Okay. Um, so to, uh, if you haven't worked with MIDI controllers in touch designer before, um, you can go to dialogues and MIDI and device mapping, and they're really easy to set up. Um, so you can just select the uh, MIDI controller here. Once you have it plugged in, it should show up. Um, as I mentioned, I unplugged it, so it's not showing up here, but you can select it here, here, and um, then create new mapping. I'm sorry, not create new mapping. Uh, devices, add device, and then that'll give you a new mapping. And uh, we're not gonna get, because this could be a whole long tutorial in itself. Um, and actually there, if you look up MIDI uh, controller, formatting on, um, on YouTube, it'll walk you through how to set this up. Um, so we're not going to get too deep into this today, 
But what I did want to focus on is talking about uh, different ways that you can use the MIDI controller in um, creating that interactivity with light installations. Okay. Uh, and then finally, actually, um, before we get to audio, I'm going to come back to that one at the very end. Uh, the thing that I wanted to look at with you guys is um, in the graphics, um, I wanted to show you how to actually map this information. Um, so um, with a lot of this project stuff that I, I've been showing you, to be able to show you the examples, a lot of the stuff is already uh, connected for that control. Um, so with the um, examples... Let's see, actually, let's go ahead and we'll do that OSC one. Um, so with this information coming in here, let's do our grid position, zero to one, perfect. Okay, um, so if you are new to Touch Designer, I just wanted to give you a really quick example of how you map stuff together, right? So we have the incoming data, we have the variable that we want to control, but how do we actually make those two the same thing? How do we have one thing control the other? So um, just wanted to show you an example of doing that in Touch Designer because it's uh, super easy, but it's essential to know. And it basically is the core of everything that we're doing is basically um, mapping one thing to be able to control the parameter of another behavior. Um, so with our, as mentioned, I'll just step back a second. Um, so I'm using the select to grab the data from our touch OSC, which is coming in in our control section. And in our, we have our null, because that's a good thing to do. Remember, it's have the null at the end. Um, so with our grid position, um, what I'm going to do is set up the grid position one which is going from zero to one, which is exactly what we want. Um, I'm gonna set up the grid position one to control our um, brightness level, which I currently had previously mapped to something else. So I'm just gonna go ahead and turn that off back to the hard coded value. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, and there's different ways to do this. Um, I'm going to press the plus sign and in this example, we're going to essentially export the value of this to control our brightness parameter. So I'm going to click the plus sign. And that's going to expose our value here. Click, hold, and just drag it over. And once it has the plus sign, it can let go. And we're going to export chop. Okay. And that's all there is. So you can see it says uh, null OSC grid position one, which is that there. Okay, so if we go over here, so now when I change it, you can see that it is changing that. And I, as I mentioned, uh, that this is controlling the lights behind me. So this switch has these different inputs coming into it. So right now it's pulling from my ramp and I can change that to the switch here and then can control my lights. Okay. And um, this is part of the audio example that we'll get to in just a second. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to show you guys is um, an approach to setting up different parameters and being able to um, basically isolate uh, the parameters that you want to be able to control and how those are matched up with the incoming data. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, so we have um, with our ramp, actually I'm gonna um, create a brand new one from scratch just to um, start from the beginning. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and create a base. Okay. And so let's say that inside of that base, I build out um, this whole project. So let's say that we have a, don't need to hold up my phone anymore. So let's say inside here that we have our, um, let's go ahead and just create a um, constant color. Okay. So we have that. 
And let's say that we want to be able to change uh, this color value here. Um, so what I like to be able to do is, um, let's say we have other operators, um, actually to create a different example, let's, um, so that we can add more operators after it. Let's go ahead and add a um, movie file in top. Movie file in. And let's add mm -hmm, from our, uh, these are images that Touch Designer gives you automatically. So let's, uh, let's do this one. Okay. Um, so let's say that I was mapping this image to the lights and let's say I wanted to do some effects on it, like a level. Okay. And mm, let's maybe, uh, flip it. Never know, why not? Um, just adding things for an example. And anything else that we want to do? Mm, yeah, let's do like a HSV adjust, right? Which is going to let us um, change the color of it. Let's add the, uh, up the saturation a bit. So you can really see that color, All right? And then, so then this is going out to our lights once we connect it up there. Um, so one way that I like to work is to think about um, different parameters that I want to be able to have control over. Um, and so once you build out this network, um, you can essentially, if you click this so that you can see the level above it, as well as this one here. Um, so here we have our base. So, right, this is the level up from this one. Um, and starting to organize things that um, we want to be able to control inside the network. So we have our movie file. Um, let's also do, oops, too far up. Um, so with our, with our level, let's say that I want to be able to control the brightness. That sounds good. Um, so on my base, I'm going to right click go to um, customize component and for the page I'm going to create a new page I always call it custom add page and you can see that it added that page for me there um, and then let's say so this is the level that I want to be able to adjust so I'm going to create a new parameter called level um, this is a float value. So I can change that to float and add that. Okay. So it is now, if you click off of it and click back, um, I now have a value called level. Um, let's say that I have this flip, um, that I want to change the flip X. So this is going to be an integer because it's either zero or one, right? So you can see if I flip that to on changes to one, switch it off and it goes to zero. So for this, I'm going to add a uh, flip and let's, let's see, sorry. So that was an integer, add perimeter and one more, uh, the HSV adjust. Let's just do the um, hue offset, right? So we'll call this hue offset. And this one I think is, yeah, it's an integer. Um, it has a much larger range, but it is an integer. Um, so int, that's good. And hue. Um, one thing that's really nice is within this mapping, you can change the range. And so if we look at the hue offset, it goes from negative 360 to 360. So full color wheel. So I can change my range minimum to negative 360 and max to 360. Okay. And nice. So now we have um, a list of parameters on our base level, on the top level that we might want to control of things inside of that, um, that aspect of the network. Okay. So what I can do from there is um, now that I have these parameters on the um, top level that I want to be able to control things within that network, um, essentially what I'm going to then do is then link them up. So I'm going to split my screen. 
And if we go inside this network, then for our level, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click and copy this parameter here, my level. And I'm going to come over here and right click and paste reference. And so now that is referencing whatever value is set to the uh, parent level. So if I adjust this value, then it's going to control this value here. Um, so let's go ahead and just really quickly do the same thing for the others. So copy parameter and then come over to the flip and paste reference. And one more copy parameter and come over here and let's go ahead and paste our reference. Okay. So now those three values that we wanted to be able to control within that network that we've built out um, are easily referenced on the upper level and whatever these change to is affecting those um, specific parameters within the sub network. So let's go ahead and I'm going to close this one. Okay. So we have our, we're back on the upper level now. Everything is inside of the space. Um, so what we can do now, since we have these set up here really easily is um, if we go to the values that we've set up with our control. So we have all these different uh, control devices coming in that we're working with. Um, essentially, you know, you might just have one, but essentially you've isolated um, the data that you want to be able to work with as the incoming control values. And so to match that up to what you want to control, all you have to do is then um, click our plus sign again. And if we drag this onto that parameter, so let's use the um, leap TX to control our level. Sorry, let me drag that again. So drag and drop and export chop. So now that that's linked up, I can control and see with my TX, it is now controlling that value. Um, now I might want to go back and um, remap the values because the uh, values that I had for the other example that I was using might not be exactly correct. It kind of blows it out, which is kind of cool actually. Um, but that is a really easy way and really um, efficient way of essentially um, building out different um, effects that you might want to have for your lights and um, figuring out what parameters of those effects you want to be able to control and then isolating those within the container on the top level as a um, custom parameter and then linking it up to the incoming control value. That's one way of setting it up um, that I find really efficient and a really nice way of working. Um, and what we can do now that we have this Let's go ahead and see if we move this all the way to the top. So now that I've hooked that up to our switch, it's um, connected to the output to the lights and it is the one I changed it to zero. So now it's the one that's being sent to the lights. Um, so if I interact with the leap motion here, you can see that, let me do it more slowly. Okay. It's probably um, the purplish pinkish on the camera is probably not translating very well. I can see a little better in person, but um, so you can see that it's now actively controlling that. So again, just a really great way of um, creating that incoming control, isolating the parameters that you want to work with and building out several different scenes um, and then linking them up in different ways. So the last thing that I wanted to show you guys is working with audio, which is really great. So if you're doing, um, uh, lighting for live performances, if you do show production, or if you're doing installations where people are creating sounds or something is audio responsive in different ways, there's a lot of different things that you can do with it. Um, then working with audio is really nice because uh, it can respond in real time. You can have a microphone, you can have um, a music file that's maybe affecting it. So there's a lot of different things that you can do using the audio to control different parameters of the lighting. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into that. Um, so there's a couple different ways to bring the audio into Touch Designer. Um, you can use the audio file in. In this case, we are using the example file that comes with Touch Designer, which if you work with Touch Designer quite a bit, you will come to know very well. Um, so that is automatically loaded in there. Um, we also have our audio device in. So if you're working with a, a microphone 
or a audio interface, bringing in an instrument of different sorts, um, then that's what you would use for that. Um, this, of course, is pulling in audio data in real time, whereas the audio file is something that is uh, pre-recorded, pre-rendered. The analysis is real time, but the audio file already exists as opposed to um, an instrument coming in where that's happening in the moment when somebody's creating it. So different type of bringing in audio information. Um, so for the quick example, um, we have our audio file. Um, I'm using a math chop essentially to combine these stereo channels into one channel that's averaging them. Um, and then I'm using the analyze chop to analyze the audio information. Um, and this is where it's converted essentially from the, the audio channel to a single value that represents the uh, power of the um, music itself or the audio, whatever it is coming in. There's different ways that you can analyze it. So average, maximum, minimum. Um, we're using RMS power, root mean squared. Not that you need to know that, but that's what it stands for, um, which essentially represents the uh, speaker, um, what it would be doing uh, if the music was playing through a speaker. Um, so it's a fairly accurate representation of that. And so if you want to um, get an idea of the bass, and uh, the power behind the music, then that's a, a good way of represent with the RMS power. Um, and then I'm renaming it just so that further down the line when we merge it, um, I know what this value is. And finally filtering it so that it's a little bit smoother when, um, when it's coming through. So that it just, whatever the effect is, it makes it a little bit smoother. Um, the other thing that I wanted to show you guys, um, so this is a really uh, simple way of getting a single value from the audio to play uh, to control things. Um, there's also within Touch Designer um, this uh, audio analysis um, container that's already, this tool that's already there um, that I've dropped in for you guys to explore. Um, so this actually, um, it is pretty nice for breaking things out into the kick, um, kick snare rhythm, uh, different parameters that are pretty essential in uh, pulling out different components of a song. So it is pretty nice that it's already done that for you. Um, there are a lot of times when you might want to just create your own. Um, in Touch Designer, it's really nice to have that ability to just custom create all of your own tools from scratch. Um, so for this example, I put this here because it's a really great tool to, to play around with to do uh, some different stuff. But of course, don't be afraid to just create your own from scratch. Um, so with the audio analysis, um, we're going to put a null at the end so that we can see the outcoming information from that. So we have our low, mid, high, kick, snare, drum, etc., cetera, um, all of that. And then I'm merging it um, with the value that we had before just so that I have those all in one, um, one operator together. And then I'm sending that out and up to our... Out again to our um, graphic container. So I'm pulling that information in here. So we have our audio analysis. And then we can, just like I showed you with the example before, then easily map that to control these parameters that we've already set up to receive um, that mapping to be controlled by those values. Um, so what I've done for this example here is essentially set up um, two different shapes so that one shape is being triggered by the uh, kick drum, I believe I set up, let's see, uh, snare, sorry. So the um, circle is being activated by the snare and the uh, square, the border alpha, is being activated by the kick detection. Um, now to retract, sorry, my statement, of course I didn't set this up inside the container uh, like we did previously. Um, these are on the top level, but you could of course build this out exactly like we did before and then build out several other different layers and have them respond in different ways. Uh, maybe set up uh, downstream where it's affecting, um, actually you could just do the color here. So you don't need to set up that downstream. Um, so um, if you have things where it's only a few operators, uh, it's sometimes nice to not have to put it inside of a container and have a container, or I should say a base, have a base with one operator inside of it or two operators inside of it because then you're um, diving for no reason sometimes. Um, but if you wanted to create a, a base and put these inside of it and then build it out and do more complex effects, then that's exactly how you do that is the example that I showed before. Um, and then put the 
control values up on top and make it super easy to, to link those up. Cool. So I hope that, um, I know we kind of went over a lot of examples rather quickly. Um, I wanted to show you guys a lot of different stuff today. And we did focus a lot on the technical side of things um, and spanning a lot of different um, types of control. Uh, so we talked about um, working with OSC input. We talked about working with audio. Um, but the last thing that I wanted to show you guys is um, how to create a custom interface so that you can, once you have all this stuff set up, you can actually control things um, with a custom interface within Touch Designer. So the way that you build out a custom interface in Touch Designer, um, you'll notice that I kept saying container by accident and correcting myself because they are two different things. Um, they both act as kind of uh, compartments for putting other things inside of them. Uh, but the container is something very specific where the container is uh, for UI elements, whereas a base is uh, not for UI elements. Um, so if you double click and go to the uh, comp, the very first tab, and then go to container instead of base container um, and then container inside of it then you can build out different UI elements like for example um, let's just go ahead and quickly I'm going to add a button and a slider uh, and some other things and you can add more um, more unique UI elements if you go to dialogues and go to where my palette browser and go to UI um, and then you have all these different UI elements that you can add so pop menu radio list simple list all these different things um, that you can add go to basic widgets you have um, button just to show you an example drag some of these over um, and you can configure these in so many different ways so um, Anything you could dream of building out interface-wise in Touch Designer or UI-wise, um, it makes it really easy to do either through these uh, widgets that they've created or just creating your own. You have full flexibility to build anything you could possibly imagine. So to show you an example of that, this is a UI that I built out to um, explore different uh, controls for introspection. Um, so introspection, of course, uh, responds to your heartbeat using the heartbeat sensor. And then in between, um, there's different effects and different uh, animations that I can program to um, control the lights in different ways. And so all of this is uh, interactive. So I can um, change the different parameters and get a preview using that previs that we talked about. So this is um, the previs uh, window, being able to see what that looks like with the triangular configuration. Um, and I can affect those. And all of these are um, interactive. So as I click on them, then it's going to uh, change those. And then um, this is a side preview of what it looks like. So this is a front preview. This is a side preview of the triangles lined up with um, all eight of them, seeing what it looks like from different angles. Um, and also um, this is live. So as I'm testing and changing all these things, of course, then it would send out to lights so that I can uh, test all this out in real time and see what it looks like on the lights and um, figure out what effects I like and then use that to um, do the custom programming for those effects. Cool. So I hope that you guys got a lot out of um, this class, learning the basic setups and then learning how to uh, configure the network depending on what makes sense for your project, um, get some tips on working with different sensors and how to bring that data into Touch Designer, and then finally being able to customize different interfaces to be able to um, build that interactive interface and test out and control things um, from within Touch Designer and uh, be able to fully customize every aspect of the project. So 